Welcome to the Rest Studio Orbis channel, and now we go north to St. Paul to explore Old World Minnesota. It should be noted that St. Paul is part of what are called the Twin Cities in Minnesota, Minneapolis and St. Paul. We'll begin our explorations with St. Paul, as it is the capital of the state of Minnesota. Many intriguing accounts of St. Paul, and yet it's yet another Midwestern city, albeit in the more northern latitudes, although not quite as far north as Canada, that seems to have developed in a very short amount of time, and naturally it occurred in the 19th century. In this image here, we're looking at the Cathedral of St. Paul, which we have explored before, and something that even caused us to question the nature of reality given its immense size and unprecedented location and construction time in the midst of St. Paul. We find many intricacies with the development of St. Paul, and we're going to consider how it started as the city and how it became the capital city of Minnesota. Now, it should be noted we're in the state adjacent to Iowa, where we explored Des Moines, and we look at St. Paul, and in this particular bird's eye view map, composed in 1883, we see the population was 75,000. And realizing that St. Paul was founded in the early 1840s, and then declared the capital city in 1849, the population was only 1,000 in 1850. By 1880, it had grown to 41,000, and then 1900, 163,000, and then 271,000 by 1930. So rapid growth, no limitations on logistics. And just look at this. From a very small community to this impressive city, and here we have the various incarnations of the state capital. There have been three of them. We'll be looking at them and that's the second one that was depicted on this bird's eye view map. Here we have the county courthouse and city hall of St. Paul. That's now an art deco building. And over here we have the Church of the Assumption, another impressive Catholic church that we'll be looking at. And this has been covered by other explorers in the St. Paul area. And we also have one of these customs houses and post offices and supposedly the courthouse as well, another impressive structure. Looking around St. Paul, though, in the bird's eye view, and remember this is a drawing, it doesn't prove anything necessarily, we see some interesting buildup here off the side of the river. Now, is this the river bank? Although we've got evidence that it appears to have been bricked, constructed, and improved. What other intriguing structures do we have when we look at St. Paul? Well, we can see where the state capital is, but over here in this particular area, we'll see where the Cathedral of St. Paul will be constructed later. And right now we see that there's a very impressive house there, but is that necessarily the truth? Well, we don't know. Bird's eye view is just a drawing. It was always impressive to me, though, that they could lay out these drawings, and we see where the Cathedral of St. Paul is in the location in relation to the Minnesota State Capitol. Here we have one of these maintenance areas for trains, and of course we're told that the reason that St. Paul grew so quickly is its position at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi River. And we see that there is also a lot of infrastructure for the trains. And indeed, the train empire was built going through Minnesota. Interesting slanted construction building here. If you look in the key, you'll see that that's an army building. Very intriguing. So many different puzzling anomalies, though, looking at St. Paul. Let's look at some of these buildings they have depicted in this bird's eye view. And we have some very impressive and well-built buildings already in existence in what we're told is 1883. To include the state capital, and remember that's the second of the three state capitals in Minnesota. And we also have this image of the Ryan Hotel, similar to the Victoria Hotel in Des Moines, Iowa, and naturally it's no longer with us, as indeed many of these structures are no longer with us, to include the second capital of Minnesota. But impressive nonetheless for what's depicted. But what exactly is really being told to us on these bird's eye view maps? It's always something we have to remember. Looking at the population, we see that impressive growth. 1,000 in 1850, a year after it was declared the territorial state or the territorial capital. And then by 1940, 287,000. Here's a view of St. Paul in 1856. Now, again, this is just a drawing or a rendering. So once again, what does this exactly prove? But it does give us an idea that there are buildings that are simply out there in the middle of the grass. Quite intriguing. Here we have a very poor image from 1869. And we see more or less what we'd expect to see. Some shacks and some smaller structures, but again, based on the quality of the image, what can you really say? What kind of picture is it painting of St. Paul? This is Alexander Ramsey, early mayor of St. Paul, first territorial governor of Minnesota, and later the secretary of war in the Rutherford B. Hayes administration. He bears a striking resemblance to actor Brian Dennehy. I wonder if he ever arrested Rambo for vagrancy in St. Paul after the Mexican War. And here we have a plaque designating Carver's Cave, an interesting cave explored by a member of Rogers Ranger's Northwest Expedition, where it was stated that the Native Americans had a connection to a great spirit in the cave. Very intriguing. 
And there's also the other presence of the Native Americans in the area, namely the Dakota. And here we have some, what will be told are Indian mounds, and it even says so on the plaque. Although what's really under there is up to anyone's speculation. I always wonder on these mounds myself, as you well know. We have other interesting images, though, of St. Paul, where we see that it appears to be very well cared for, and it seems to be a very peaceful and pretty place that would no doubt attract hundreds of thousands of European immigrants in record time. And here we even have the very first lock and dam on the Mississippi River in the early, early 20th century. And let's not forget all the other wonders that we see on the Mississippi River as we go south to include the largest or one of the largest dams built in the world down in Iowa. Looking at this panorama that's supposedly from circa 1900, we can see many well-built structures across St. Paul. Hey, look at that. There's the third and current state capital. Although, if this was 1900, it should still be under construction, but maybe they were finishing the interior. <laughs> Here we have a fire station. We can see that this is a very well-built building to be fireproof itself, as we know that, that fires were a great hazard in the 19th century. St. Paul didn't experience a fire, but it did experience a tornado. And here we see some of the, what we're told, are thousands of steam or paddle steamers that came through St. Paul. Fortunately, unlike St. Louis, the city down the river, none of these steamers caught fire and caused the city to caught fire or catch fire. So very intriguing. And we have some of these other images that give us the idea that there was a laid out neighborhood, although this does show you the snow and it should be noted that four to five months out of every year, it is oftentimes well below freezing and it gets very cold in Minnesota. Ah, yes. And... Here we look at one of the impressive larger structures, this being the James J. Hill House, one of those wondrous railroad magnets and considered the empire builder. Of course, everybody was an empire builder in the 19th century, it seems. And a look at its nearby neighbor, the Cathedral of St. Paul, built 1906 to 1915, and one of the largest cathedrals in the United States, in St. Paul, in Minnesota. And then here it is pictured with the mansion, and you get an idea for the sizes of these respective structures. So very interesting that the city of St. Paul, isolated in Minnesota at the time, although it was a confluence of major rivers, grew up the way that it did. Here you have this impressive conservatory that's part of Como Park Zoo in St. Paul. Very impressive structure, and for some reason it gives me a reminder of one of the many crystal palaces, although it's certainly not affiliated with that. It's just a very intriguing structure that we see, and it's something that always impressed me as part of St. Paul that I thought I would include with the presentation. But I'm sure there is nothing remotely questionable about this structure or any of the other structures in this exploration, as they are all well documented. Speaking of that, let's start with the Minnesota State Capitol, and this is the first one built in 1853. And we can see that it has our classic pediment columns and a very rudimentary dome, although this is the first one, and it should be noted that they still had a dome. They did improve it, but unfortunately, despite the improvements to this particular state capitol, it was destroyed by fire. So it looks like some of the similar unfortunate disasters did afflict Minnesota to an extent. Well, no worries. When one state capital burns, you just build a bigger, better one. In 1883, they built the bigger, better one that was depicted in the bird's eye view map we looked at earlier. And we can see this is a very impressive state capital, although compared to the third one, it is kind of a dump, and so eventually they tore it down in the 20th century. However, looking at some of the interior shots that we have of it, it doesn't seem like it's <laughs> insufficient to be considered a state capital. And of course, I'm always joking when I say it's a dump because honestly, the second state capital built in the mid 19th century exceeds pretty much anything that we could build today. The only thing we could build is more space, but that's not to say it would be a better structure. But I'm sure that's just because of our numerous safety standards and internet distractions that prevents us from building so wonderfully. I always found this image interesting when they moved all these captured battle flags by Civil War veterans that was supposedly from the Civil War from the second state capital in Minnesota to the third one. What do you think is going on with this image? Let me know in the comments. And now we move on to the third state capital, built 1896 to 1905. And this is certainly no slouch for a state capital. And I dare say that this is in the top 10 of United States state capitals in terms of beauty and raw authenticity and architectural achievement when it was constructed. The construction timeline is very impressive as well. So the second state capital not being sufficient, they knocked out this beauty. And we saw in the earlier bird's eye view just how it looked. But I have to say, this is a very impressive state capital. And while it seems to be more centered around the dome and we don't have subsidiary domes and we don't have a five dome state capital like we do in Minnesota's southern neighbor, 
we still have an impressive capital and one that has many different looks depending on the lighting and I always find that so intriguing how with the older buildings you have different colorizations or different appearances from the lighting especially when reflected in the stone or the granite or whatever they're telling us it's made out of for this particular exploration and of course there is the incessant renovation that occurs with these old world buildings and yet even with that they still endure and we're told that they need to be renovated because they're so old and yet when you look at this you don't get any sort of hint of this very impressive structure requiring any renovation any more than the Iowa State Capitol or any other state capital that was constructed that's still standing today in the 19th century very impressive dome well here's our construction photo that should clear up any questions that you have about the authenticity of the construction of this building. I always like how we seem to have workers that are standing around. Well, they could just stand around with their hands on their hips because they didn't have safety standards and they didn't have cell phones to distract them. Here's the architect and he's just chilling about on the roof of the state capitol and we can see another very convincing construction photo that shows us that there is absolutely nothing that would cause us to construct question the legitimacy of the construction of this building. The interior is exceptionally impressive. And I have to say, considering these three neighboring states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa, all of their state capitals are unbelievably beautiful, and they have tremendous interiors on all three of them. We see the classic arches, the concentric designs, and all of the very impressive stonework, whether it's granite, sandstone, limestone, or some combination of the three with granite. And isn't this an interesting statue or what we'd want to call a common statue or impression of horses being led along with figures that seem to be, maybe we could even say, demigod humans. Looking on the interior, though, we can see that, once again, no detail has been spared. We have pillars that are integrated with the walls. We have the beautiful halls and the very large doorways and many numerous arches. And looking up in the dome, we see that there is a very unique design within the Minnesota State Capitol. I really appreciate the coloring and you can see that this is a beautiful and well laid out dome and it compares with many of the other domes that we've looked at in other state capitals. And yet looking closer at the Minnesota State Capitol we can see the fine detailing. Very impressive that they managed to pull off this construction in under 10 years, especially when you consider the interior. So maybe that photo we looked at earlier was indeed from 1900 and they were just finishing the interior. I mean look at this. How long would this have taken? All the finished work, I mean, I know the country was just completely filled, and it's safe to assume Minnesota was with artisans and craftsmen at the time, who were all looking for employment, and were all capable of easily throwing up a building like this in a record amount of time. And it should be noted that budget constraints were no consideration, as there were no economic problems to report of, except for a couple panics going on. Once again, though, looking at the detailing with many of the columns and the way they're decorated, you can see that the interior of this state capitol compares with anything that we have looked at. So once again, I think it's safe to say that we're not just looking at a state capitol here, we're looking at a building that could legitimately be considered a palace. And were this in any other nation, it would be quite fair to call this a palace, or a pantheon, a parthenon, or whatever fancy terminology you want for it. There's nothing lacking in this state capitol. And I have to say, these arrangement of columns is very impressive and I haven't quite seen anything like it in some of the other state capitals and remember this is on the interior and what I wouldn't give just to see one photo of some of these columns being placed on the interior and here we see these very impressive figures again and is this actually covered in gold or is this something resembling gold I don't know for sure but you know I know what they'll tell us it is something that really stands out though and then isn't this an impressive symbol hmm I have to say Finding this in the state capitol, where have I seen this symbol before though? And For some reason it looks a little familiar to me. Well, I don't know, let me know what you think in the comments. Let's move on to the city hall and the county courthouse for Ramsey, constructed in 1932. As this is an art deco building, it was constructed in a year. And the max timeline on any art deco building is two years. And this replaced allegedly the early courthouse that bore a striking resemblance to the previous state capitol. But again, I'm sure that's all just coincidence. And once again, we can see the same phenomenon, even though this is an Art Deco building, in the different forms of light, you see many different colorations. Now, I know you'll just tell me that's just what buildings do. They have different appearances because of the construction material. 
But isn't it interesting though that when you're looking at what's considered a legitimate art deco building, and believe it or not, there are a couple attempts in Minnesota and the Dakotas where they try to declare buildings art deco, but you just know they're not art deco. They just don't fit the style. You can see some of the detailings. Now, granted, this is a little bit more of a modest and a subtle art deco building on the exterior. But remember, there's more to a building than just the exterior. And it's still impressive that they pulled off just the construction of this building in a year, just looking at the exterior alone. What exactly does the interior tell us about this particular structure? And what do we see? Well, on the entryway, we can see more of the classic Art Deco right there with uh, some of the figures and how they appear. And it looks like someone wrote in there the city hall and the courthouse, although <laughs> compared to the rest of the structure, I'm going to say it looks a little... Hasty, maybe? I'm not trying to be cruel because, honestly, everything else in this building is extremely impressive and very ornate and detailed, and not like many buildings that we'd see today. Let's take a closer look at this inscription. Very impressive with many figures, and perhaps we could explain their presence, and maybe they make perfect sense, and maybe they don't. Or maybe this is something that was altered and added later. I'm not exactly sure, but it looks really good. On the inside, though, we can see the true ornate detail that we've come to associate with Art Deco buildings and this very large and tall figure. Very impressive. And, of course, this is something that you need to round out your county courthouse and your city hall. And yet, looking at other details that we have in the interior, we can see the classic speechless beauty that we've come to expect with many Art Deco buildings, with some of these pillars and the way the walls are laid out. And then, of course, why not have the golden elevator doors with wonderful figures on them? And I'm sure that was very easy to do. And, of course, that's something that you could do in a year. And it's probably every single elevator door. And yet, looking at some of the other interiors, we have some of the other beauty that we've come to expect with Art Deco. Interesting with the handrail there. And isn't that what you'd really call a conference room? And I like the windows even, and the way they align with the pillars. And here you see a figure with this particular statue, just to see exactly how tall it is. I really would have enjoyed seeing photos of them actually emplacing that statue and putting it up in this particular building. So if anybody could find some, let me know in the comments, because I would enjoy looking at it. It's a very impressive figure, and it goes well with the rest of the interior of this particular Art Deco building. So it's safe to say that the Ramsey County Courthouse and the St. Paul City Hall is not lacking when it comes to being a legitimate Art Deco building, and I think we can safely certify it as such. Definitely something I'm going to retain on my list for an on-site follow-up exploration when I get to St. Paul in Minneapolis. Now let's go to the Landmark Center, built 1894 to 1901. This was our ubiquitous building that doubled as a county courthouse, a post office, and a customs house. Yes, another one of these. And of course it resembles a castle. Yet, we've seen this design many times before. We've seen this same type of design classified as a Union Station in other cities, and we've also seen it as a Custom House in other cities. Well, while this might not be the best photograph, when we look at some of the other photographs of it, we can see that, once again, yes, they're renovating it, of course, because, again, these are older buildings and they always have to be renovated. At least that's what we'll be told. Almost looks as though the roof is made out of copper, and we have many turrets and towers and impressive detailings on this structure. And we can see here on this exterior photo a much better quality, and we see in the background there the Cathedral of St. Paul. So a very impressive skyline for the city of St. Paul. And here in this older photo, we can see that this particular structure has always been around. And again, I'm wondering what the exact composition of the construction material is, because it seems as though the structure is doing very well. And it's coming up on hmm, well over 120 years old, and who knows how old the actual materials that it's made out of truly are. But it seems to be holding up quite well, and it's definitely something that stands out within the skyline of St. Paul, something that we find impressive. And even in the older images, we can see how it seems to be something that defies simple explanation for how they managed to pull it off. But, you know, at least they didn't say that they built it within a year or two years, but that was before, you know, they'd really discovered the Art Deco technology. The interior is stunning, and that's about the only way I can describe it. All of these different pillars and floors all integrated together leading up to these skyline or these skylights. Very impressive structure. And it should not surprise you to know that this is also yet another wedding venue because that's one of our questions if we're going into a legitimate old world building. 
And we can see that this very much is a legitimate old world building, as again, we appreciate the interior. And I think that's really where, as impressive as this, this structure is on the exterior, it's the interior where we find a deeper story. Because really, we just don't have structures that are built like this now that have this kind of interior beauty as well. And here you can see that they have ample interior space for any sort of performance or large gathering because there is a lot of space. And yet at the same time, it's done within the interior of a very impressive and beautiful building where no doubt everyone feels spiritually inspired and creatively impressed. Even looking at the older images, though, we can see how this structure seems to stand out in ways that we can't easily explain. But it's really there, and it continues to this day as a wedding venue and a main event area. And we can see even in the floor some of the impressive detailings. So again, impressive construction and architecture in the late 19th and early 20th century. Although, let's be honest, this is the late 19th century. And again, look at the detailing here with all these pillars and the arches and just the incredible beauty. You can see why having a conversation there, I'd be inclined to pay more attention to the building. And as if it's not enough, they have uh, skating and a hockey rink out in front of it because, let's be honest, this is Minnesota. So building a castle with the rough winners is no challenge whatsoever especially in the late 19th century. Look at the fireplace here. I mean, even with these little pillars on either side of this fireplace, and what exactly is this made out of? It looks like it's very well-decorated material of some kind. Is it marble, or is it some sort of advanced concrete? Well, look at a couple schools, and here we have some old mains. I believe this is uh, Hamline University, and a very impressive old main, and I always find it intriguing when a college manages to retain their original old main from the mid 19th century. This being the old main building of McAllister College. So once again, many impressive structures, schools, churches, everything all across St. Paul. And here yet another impressive college with a pediment and pillars, columns, because it's no challenge whatsoever to do that. And we're only scratching the surface in this initial exploration of St. Paul. And here we have uh, St. Matthew's School here, another older school, again from the 19th century, standing just fine and managing to weather all of these very challenging Minnesota winters without really showing any sign of degradation. Well, let's look at the Church of the Assumption, constructed 1869 to 1874. Now, a little interesting note, there was a large Native American uprising that occurred during the U.S. Civil War that Minnesota had to contend with. And as soon as that was over, much like the city of Atlanta, despite being destroyed, they managed to build St. Paul and its twin city of Minneapolis very quickly and populate it very quickly, while basically the rest of the Midwest and then the West was being populated all in the 19th century. Again, very impressive with these logistic limitations. And look at these images that we have, and this shows that this was always a very impressive structure. And as we saw on the bird's eye map, at least what a drawing proves, that this structure has always been there. And it's always been very impressive with its two towers. And I suppose it's a little easier to explain this uh, two-towered Catholic church that stands out quite fittingly in the St. Paul skyline. A little bit easier in a city the size of St. Paul than, say, a city like Dyersville in Iowa, which is only just over a thousand when they built their very impressive minor basilica. It should be noted that this is not a minor basilica, but it's still a very impressive church with its twin towers. Of course, oddly enough, when St. Paul started, it was only a thousand people too. What are the odds? Looking at some of the interior photos, though, we can see what we've come to expect, and a lot of people simply write, that off, write this off as saying, yes, they could easily do this in 1869 to 1874, because this was a religious structure, and people were a lot more pious in the 19th century. So therefore, they worked harder, and they had all the wondrous contractors, craftsmen, and artisans who could pull off a structure like this in the exterior and the interior. Still, this is a very impressive church, from floors to walls to the ceiling, and again, the way everything is so geometrically precise on the interior of this structure. And I think that's really where we get the full story of the difficulty behind this particular structure. And it definitely matches many of the other very beautiful churches that we've seen across the land. And naturally, this is a wedding venue. And as we say, that's always the benchmark test for a true old world building. And I'm sure if you got married at this Church of the Assumption, it will be guaranteed a lifelong marriage of peace, prosperity, and happiness. Again, looking at the interior, though, and looking at the altar, you can see that it has that fine geometric precision. And it's always impressive to me that all these churches, from the largest ones to the small ones, were built 
with all of this precision and again all in the same time frame especially all the churches and all the structures that went up in the 19th century because remember they essentially built a capital city where none existed and it was the capital city of minnesota from the very start now there was some debate about saint peter a town down by mankato in minnesota which coincidentally was featured in the little house in the prairie series that was supposed to be the state capital of Minnesota, but apparently a territorial legislator ran off with the bill, and so it became St. Paul. Yes, that's the story behind it. The Cathedral of St. Paul, built 1906 to 1915, for the low, low price of a million dollars. Going off my inflation calculations, that's in the, in the neighborhood of the mid-30 millions now. Do you really think we could build a structure like this for a billion dollars or a trillion dollars today? And I'm being rather serious, and I want to know what you think in the comments. Do you think it's really possible for us to build this structure now? You know, with all of our safety regulations in place, the fact that people are distracted by the internet, you know, all the other present day challenges that we have. This is a truly impressive, and I dare say, reality-defined structure. The other interesting thing is that this Cathedral of St. Paul actually sits on the most prominent hill on St. Paul itself. It's not the state capitol, unlike in Iowa. And strangely enough, they also have a column monument out in front that is dedicated to the Civil War, similar to the way the Iowa Soldiers and Sailors Monument stands next to the Iowa State Capitol. But this isn't the state capitol, although you could be forgiven for confusing it as such because it is on the most prominent hill in St. Paul. This is the Cathedral of St. Paul. As if that uh, cathedral, the assumption, wasn't impressive enough. Oh no, we need the most impressive cathedral, one of the largest cathedrals in the United States. And when you see some of the other images, this one coming up, this really gives you an idea of the size and immensity of this very impressive structure. You know, because having a cathedral, the assumption, that's just not going to cut it. You need to have something that legitimately compares with St. Paul in London. But, and this was the Kittleson Mansion, one of the houses they supposedly had to demolish to build the impressive Cathedral of St. Paul. Of course. Why would anybody demolish something like this? Now we're told that it was wrecked in, in a state of decay. Look at the organ, though. And we have looked at the Cathedral of St. Paul in our alternate realities exploration, and I'll put that link in this exploration, but didn't really focus on the organ quite as much. And very impressive window as well. Now, of course, we're told that the architect of this building was also the lead architect of the St. Louis World's Fair. So he came up the Avenue of the Saints, as it were, in the early 20th century, and architected this very impressive cathedral, one of the largest in the United States. And here we see them working on the organ, and in the background you can see some of the detailing with the windows. Now, how long did this take? Nine years to do this and a budget of a million dollars, or about 35 to 36 million now? Do you really think that such things could be done now? And again, let's just say you had an unlimited budget. And we'll even give you the benefit of having unlimited time. Do you think a structure like this could be done now? Because as I said before in our earlier exploration, there's just something about this Cathedral of St. Paul that is quite frankly reality defying. And I'm just coming out and saying it. It is very difficult to believe that this was done in nine years in St. Paul, Minnesota, 1906 to 1915. The more you look at it, and the more you consider the size, the beauty, the detail, and the geometric precision, and yes, I know we had an architect from the St. Louis World's Fair. It just defies all explanation. Well, nearby to it, we have the James J. Hill House, built 1891. This has 44,000 square feet, and you saw in that earlier image how it compared with the massive Cathedral of St. Paul. So James J. Hill was another one of those impressive railroad magnets, and again, he came from very humble origins, but worked really hard, and in his bio, he even said that he worked hard, and the next thing you know, he became the empire builder. Although I joked earlier that I think every single leader in the 19th century had to be an empire builder, with the fact that we built capital cities, we built railroads, and expanded the nation, built the nation, and did it very easily within a few short decades. And here on in the interior, you can see how this building is 44,000 square feet. Now, is this really what you consider a home? Or is this a hall for King Arthur and his court? Because quite frankly, I think King Arthur would be impressed by this structure. And yet, just so much space and at the same time, again, the same kind of detailing within the walls and the ceilings and the doorways. Now, of course, it's 
explainable because you know this individual had infinite money infinite resources and you know again when they constructed this impressive edifice there were no safety standards in place at the time and we had all those craftsmen running all over the nation so okay i understand it and you know i'm not necessarily saying i fully accept it but looking at the interior though and you see all of these columns again and there are some very rudimentary construction photos, if you want to call them that, of this particular structure, although I'm not including them in this exploration because they don't really reveal anything. It just looks like the building's empty on the inside, but the exterior shell is completed. Naturally, they do not include any photos of any of the columns being erected on the inside of the building because why would anybody want to see that? That's kind of boring. But you look around, though, and you can see the amount of space that you have. Oh, here's the conference room. Oh, uh, why is there a screen there? Maybe uh, Nikola Tesla showed up and, you know, hooked him up a projection screen? <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. Obviously, it's added later, but still. It's intriguing, though, how a house that was constructed in 1890 seems to fit into many different modern uses so easily. And indeed, this is yet another wedding venue, and this is also a major events venue, because why wouldn't it be? You have ample space. Here's apparently the original bathtub that was used in this mansion, and it seems rather, well, subtle. Is this really the tub that was used? It's still very impressive, though, and how much space is taken in the tiling, if that's all original. But everywhere you look within this house, this mansion, this castle, you can see the aspects of detail that, once again, will be explained by the fact that this was an individual who was exorbitantly wealthy. As everybody in the United States in the 19th century, it seems, had the ability to become. Yet, oddly enough, it seems to be more limited. I mean, we still have these stories in the 21st century of these individuals who came from humble origins and rose to the top, the classic American dream. But for some inexplicable reason, it just doesn't seem to be as common as it was in the 19th century. Now, I certainly don't want to suggest this is because our society has changed in any way, shape, or form. But it's what we're expected to be believe when we consider the mainstream account. So be it. And these older images do show that this structure has always been around and it's a very impressive and large edifice. But what are your thoughts when you look at it? And of course we have one of these very well decorated fireplaces and look at the detailing right there in that pillar and just the lights in all this. I don't know, once again there's something about this structure that seems to defy simple explanation. And then of course they have a very impressive organ. Because, you know, somebody knew that it was going to be a venue for weddings and you needed to install very impressive organ. Otherwise, the structure just wouldn't measure up. And here's another image of that organ. Well, this is only our first look at St. Paul. We'll be taking plenty of other looks at it because I think that there are many other structures that we need to look into in a little more detail. There are many houses in the area of the Cathedral of St. Paul. And again, just look at the amount of space that's within this structure. Why would anybody, I mean, even, even if you're some rich individual, a railroad magnet, want to have this kind of space within your residence? Even looking at some of the skylighting that we have in here, I mean, this is a very unique structure. And it still stands and it's used quite frequently in St. Paul, and we can see why. I'm just not exactly sure what to make of it. What are your thoughts? Because just the amount of space, and look, we even have columns up on the second floor in this image. I would really appreciate photos that show that being done. Well, I hope you enjoyed this exploration of St. Paul. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.